Gators Breakdown, join Gators Breakdown Plus. Starting at $3 a month, get access to unique episodes, plus a blog, chat room, giveaways, shoutouts, and more. Gators Breakdown Plus is furthering the interaction with fans and listeners like you. Head to GatorsBreakdown.SupportingCast.FM to join Gators Breakdown Plus today. Gators Breakdown, because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Finally back live. It's been a couple weeks since we've been live. Here we are with Will Miles from Read and Reaction, and find him on Twitter at Will Miles. SEC and joining us this week is Neil Blackman from Saturday Down South. Will, man, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, back live. So, uh, you know, Gene Chiswick last week, really, really good interview there. Uh, but back live this week. Yeah, Chiswick gave us a bunch of gold. Where you know there are probably four <laughs> or five articles I can mine out of that where he was talking about, you know, what kind of decisions to, or what does he look at when he's trying to decide whether he's going to let an assistant coach go and those sorts of things. That that was really interesting to hear from a head coach the things that he's using to evaluate his assistant coaches. So that was that was a fun interview. But yeah, like you said, back live this week and glad to have Neil here. Yeah, Neil, uh, man, you can finally breathe a little bit. Uh, Unfortunately, basketball season didn't last as long as we wanted to, but uh, you can you can catch your breath a little bit. Yeah, no, it's nice to. Uh, they took care of some of the portal stuff real quick for me too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, just taking a taking a step back from the multiple shows a week uh, Florida basketball hour thing and diving back into football like we all do in the SEC. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the cool thing. You know, here on Gators Breakdown, we're all football all the time, and you guys at Florida Basketball Hour, all basketball all the time. So uh, it, uh, it nice, nice little opposites there. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, you, you dive into football. That's what you do at Saturday Down South most of the time, right, right, for those guys. And a uh, couple good articles, one last week, one uh, this week, and talking about, uh, of course, you know, what uh, – what would define Florida for, for 2021 and plenty, plenty uh, to discuss along those lines. But uh, man, it's, um, it's been a while since I talked to probably, I don't think, I'm not sure you've been on the podcast since what last, so at some point during the uh, season, last season. Yeah, probably usually uh, you do, you, you do me the honor of having me on near the Georgia game all the yeah. time, which is, which is <laughs> nice. So uh, especially this year. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's been about that. Yeah, I think so. I think so. So we'll get back into the swing of things uh, uh, here, talking uh, talk, talking some football. But remember, you can find Gators Breakdown at news4jacks.com slash Gators Breakdown. You'll find all the Gators Breakdown episodes there as well. Uh, and uh, look, please share, rate, and review the show on YouTube. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out here on Gators Breakdown and follow us on social media. We're on Twitter and Facebook at Gators Breakdown. So, Neil, you raised a whole lot of good points uh, in those last two articles. You did offense last week. You released a defense today. Uh, You've shared them on social media, shared them on Gators Breakdown Plus. Now all the uh, listeners and um, Gator fans, football followers uh, that listen to our podcast here, we'll get to dive into uh, those articles. And we'll start on the offensive side. And look, I I want you guys to – I put the link in the uh, subscription so you guys could go read uh, Neil's pieces here. We're not going to – go into every point there i want you guys to go read it uh, of course as well uh but we'll get into you know some of the highlights here and uh we'll we'll all three discuss it but let's start of course have to start quarterback emory jones and all that so emory jones is ready to be the starting quarterback but will florida be versatile on offense you ask and i'm going to extend that a little bit neil uh one of our gators breakdown plus members colin says you know lost the biggest playmakers uh, from last year, but still have talent all over the field. Do you expect the 2021 Gators to score more on the ground or through the air? So, of course, I think that uh, you know, goes a little bit into your question that you asked, you know, will Florida be versatile in offense? Yeah, I think, you know, and I think it's a point. I mean, I'm actually interested in Will on this because I think it's a point that he's made a bunch at Read and Reaction, all the good work that he does. But you have to be multiple 
uh, nowadays in college football, I think, to win um, the biggest games. And so, you know, I'm not saying that you cannot win a lot of football games with either the run dominant spread that we're used to Dan Mullen having, like when you think of his Mississippi State teams, when you think of Tebow, uh, or, you know, if it was the pass, the more pass heavy offense that we've seen with Kyle Trask, um, you know, Florida still needs to be a little bit multiple. Of course, the Gators with Trask and all those playmakers didn't quite matter as much. I think Florida will be that run first spread that, that Mullen, you know, I don't even know if prefers is the right word anymore. I think I used it in the piece, but uh, it's certainly kind of what he started out as is this run dominant spread offense uh, type guy. And I do think Florida will be more on the ground. I think the key piece of that will be quarterback carries. I think you get into that Tebow number, that Dak Prescott number of 160 to 220 quarterback rushes. Um, could it be a little lower because the running back room is so good? Um, maybe. Uh, but I do think it starts with the ability of, of Embry Jones to run the power and, and the zone read stuff. Yeah, I, I got. I started research on that yesterday. Matter of fact, so I got in, in a few weeks. I got a whole lot of research on the trends of, you know, how much percentage of the quarterbacks were involved in the offense and the run and the pass ratio and all that. Uh, and Will, yeah, yeah, really good point there by Neil bringing it up. You know, uh, of course, it's going to rely on how much the running backs uh, get involved too. And I go back and look at it, and I, I found some back in the Mississippi State days where running backs carried the ball a lot it wasn't you know quarterback still dominated the the the, the run game when Florida won or when he wanted to run, when Dan Mullen wanted to run the ball at Mississippi State but Neil I'm gonna bring up your question and we'll transfer it to Will here I'm like you now that Dan Mullen got a taste of the throwing the ball 40 45 times a game and you see him recruiting both styles of quarterbacks now he's not just going to dual threat He's actually going out and getting pocket guys. Now, they may be athletic, but, you know, they're going to be throw-first guys. They're not the Embry Jones, Anthony Richardson type. Of course, Del Rio and Kitna and and now Evers out there on the docket. But I'm, I, I do wonder, with the taste he got of Kyle Trask, does he pass the ball more than we actually expect him to coming up this year? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's probably pretty unlikely. I think if you look I back, I mean, if you look back at when Felipe Franks was the quarterback, they they ran the ball about 55% of the time. And then the minute Kyle Trask came in, all of a sudden that flipped in that Kentucky game and then from then on. Um, and, and so Mullen has always talked about making sure that he – puts his players in the best position to succeed. And the best thing that Kyle Trask had going for him was his accuracy from the pocket. And so they took advantage of that last year and took advantage of that two years ago. But I think if you're thinking about what the offense is going to look like, um, sort of at a high end, I think kind of what we saw against Michigan in the bowl game with Felipe Franks there in 2018 is maybe what you should expect, right? I mean, Franks, I think, ran for like 85 or 90 yards in that game when Michigan left, you know, five guys at the line of scrimmage, five offensive linemen. They just you know, basically ran the quarterback power up the middle. Um, there were some times where the defensive ends were cheating and he was able to get around the corner. When you think about what Franks was able to do, and then you look at Emory Jones as a runner, and Jones is a lot better runner than Felipe Franks. And so I would expect some games where he's going to go for 120, 130 yards and really help supplement the running game and make those guys, the defensive ends, stay honest and hopefully open up some easy throws, right? You start looking at read option plays, you start looking at RPOs. Those things are open if the quarterback is able to run the ball and run the ball effectively. And so some of the things that Neil pointed out in terms of accuracy against Oklahoma – that offense wasn't really prepared to run what Mullen's going to be running in 2021. And so it's going to be interesting to see when you get into a game against Georgia, when you get into a game against Alabama, where the defensive players don't necessarily have to cheat because they're fast enough to be able to catch up to Emory Jones. That's where you're going to have to see the accuracy in tight windows. But, you know, against teams like Tennessee, Kentucky, South Carolina, I, I really do think that Florida is at an athletic advantage at the quarterback position that's going to allow them to do some things that looks a lot like that 2018 game against Florida State, the 2018 bowl game against Michigan. Yeah, the the Oklahoma game. I, did it count? Yes. Should we erase up from our minds? Probably so. I mean, come on. You lose your entire offense, and you practice for, what, three three times? three times in all that change that was happening. So granted, I know we wanted to see, we wanted to see more and it's not to take away anything from Oklahoma. That, that was going to be a good game regardless. You know, if, 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 if a hundred percent Florida team was out there, 
that was still going to be a really good game, the way Oklahoma was playing toward the end of the year. It's just the Florida that we got, we didn't get the Florida that we hoped we got. We got the Oklahoma that I thought we got, <laughs> we would get. Uh, and, you know, there wasn't much standing in the way of that, but especially on the offensive side of the ball. I think we can erase that. Uh, and, and I don't, I don't want to put too much on the the Emory Jones performance in that game uh, moving forward. Uh, it kind of goes to your next point, Neil, and uh, another one of our Gators Breakdown Plus members, Scott Sweat, is going to go in here. And I know we can go in many directions with this one. Uh, so even if Jones is really, really good, will Florida's offense be less prolific? And Scott goes on to extend this. He goes, we all have our thoughts about recruiting and whether you trust the services or not, talent matters. On offense, we have five-star running backs, top 100 wide receivers, a top 100 quarterback. The stars are not on the offensive line, but Hevesy has you know good lines and back at even at back his Mississippi State days. Can this offensive line elevate the offense to be an explosive level, or will they hold us back from being what we want to be? And look, of course, we've all hit on recruiting. It's pretty much how you know, Gators Breakdown got, got on get on the map of all the recruiting talk and, and how important it is. But you know, you look at Florida and you look at the talent profile across the board. You know, Dan Mullen has raised it on offense. You have a stable of running backs, two five stars there. Daquan Wright was a five star at one time before he gets injured and a four, a four star. You know what Damian Pierce can bring. You know what Malik Davis can bring. Florida's really, really deep there. You got Jacob Cook, Xavier Henderson, two high profile recruits, and Emory Jones, you know, quarterback brought in with Dan Mullen, uh, top 100 uh, guy. And look, you, the talent is there. The experience that you had coming back last year is probably what's missing more so than just looking at it. last year. It was more the experience, the talent of Trask. Pitts and Tony. You, you knew those guys. The, high, the ceiling, the talent ceiling for Florida last year was really, really high. This year, I think the floor has been raised, but they're missing that top, top, top end talent. So I, I, I want to know how you know how does that translate? And you know, I think that goes to your point a little bit. You look at all those stars, all the loss from last year's team. To say this year is going to be less prolific, it's not really a shot at this year's offense. You know, you're doing those, you're doing trash, you're doing pitch, you're doing only a disservice if you expect that kind of production. Yeah, I mean, look, I didn't, and then you hit on the point that I hoped that I made, which was that I still think this this offense has a chance to be very good. Uh, it's to me, it's a matter of how do you stay on schedule, which is something that if you've covered Dan Mullen since whenever the three of us have watched Dan Mullen for over a decade. Um, you know, and I think if you watch him, that's, that's always the point of his offense. It was always the point of urban Myers offense. So last year, Florida did that with the tight end and they did that with Kadarius Tony. Right. And that was how they occupied uh, defenders and that was how they moved the sticks. So this year I think going to be a little different, but um you know, a lot of people have asked questions about things like the offensive line. Well, Mullen is really good at scheming that stuff. I mean, there's a reason that even with the line talent that they had, you know, Emory was, I think, second or first among quarterbacks in in the power five and yards per attempt on a pretty fair sample size, by the way. Um, You know, Florida's success rate when Emory ran the ball was very high. So I think Florida's going to do some of that stuff uh, offensively to move the sticks, but it's going to be more on the ground. And I think that then raises the next question, which is Tony and Pitts are one is a generational player who I think is the best tight end to ever play college football. And I have mentioned that at Saturday down South. And that's not just for me, an AFC playoff general manager told me that he thought that it was either him or Jeremy Shockey and that that was the whole discussion. Um, so Take that as you will. And then Kadarius Tony, who is one of the most versatile playmakers in the entire country. And those are the center of the offense. But now uh, it's going to be more power run concepts and probably less explosives, but certainly a chance, I think, to stay on schedule. And to your point, um, Dave, you know, you look at the talent, and I don't think you even got to Justin Shorter, who's a five star mm-hmm. transfer, Xavier Henderson, who was what? decimal points from being a five-star uh, is back. Jacob Copeland, I think, was .001 from being a five-star. Um, so, you know, there are guys there. Uh, it's just unproven dudes, um, you know, and then multiples in the running back room. And also, at least in terms of what have you done for me, your running back room is, you could argue, the two guys with the least stars, 
Um, and it's not a knock on Naquan or Malik, but <laughs> maybe they've produced more than, than everybody else, depending on what you think of Damian Pierce as a football player. Yeah, well, and, you know, kind of going to Scott's point about the offensive line and maybe holding this team back, well, they were better in run blocking, and that may determine <laughs> what, what what Florida does on offense. You know, you, you do what you do well, and, you know, you're not going to – right now, I think with Emory Jones at quarterback and not being as polished as a Kyle Trask back there and knowing the offense, knowing pre-snap what to do, where to go, you know, you're not going to ask him to drop back 40 times. And, you know, now you're not going to ask Gene DeLance to block 40 times <laughs> in pass in pass protection. You're going to be asking Gene DeLance to block 40, 50 times in a run scenario, a run scenario, and th- th- that can help. We, we, we know the issues there uh, on that side, and I've said it, and I'll, and I'll say it again. If there's somebody better, they're going to have to prove it. <laughs> and if Gene DeLance is out there, to me, for, for the third season in a row, that means somebody's – Throughout spring, throughout fall camp, hasn't proven they 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 deserve to be out there. So, uh, and Will, and Will, you've you've pointed out many times that you know you go back and look at the tape, the run blocking for Gene Lance isn't all that bad. Yeah, I mean, I think. Look, I'm not, I'm not going to say it was fantastic. I'm going to say right. it was the stronger part of his game. What I would also say is that we saw last year, especially with the defensive backs, that Florida didn't have the depth last year to make changes, and I suspect the same thing exists on the offensive line. That spring practice in particular, you know, the the 2018 recruiting class was a, a pretty good class for ball, and the 2019 class had an awful lot of attrition. And so you were relying on guys from the 2020 and 2021 classes last year. The reality is those guys are relatively young, and so getting them ready without a spring practice was, was a challenge. And I'm not sure that that challenge was met because they were more – they were more aimed towards getting everything ready for the guys that they had. And when the guys that they had with experience didn't perform, there wasn't anybody waiting in the wings. That's not an excuse this year, right? So a guy like Josh Braun, a guy like Richard Garage, those guys are going to have to perform because, you know, Stone Forsyth is gone. Brett Heggie has gone. Um, Ethan White was injured last year. We expect him to be healthy and be, and be a big part of the offensive line this year. So I suspect that a full spring camp in particular, just the strength and conditioning that everybody missed last year. You know, one of the things I think is interesting when you look at the 2019 season and even the 2018 season as well, is Florida absolutely dominated the fourth quarter both years. And last year they didn't dominate the fourth quarter. I'm not sure in any game, maybe the Arkansas game, but they they really struggled putting teams away when they were up, you know, three touchdowns. They just sort of kind of let them hang in and hang in and hang in. And then in games against LSU games against A&M and, and even against Alabama, just weren't able to get stops and and weren't able to equal weren't able to equalize what the opponent was able to do in the fourth quarter. That's Nick Savage. That's offseason training. That's um, you know an advantage that hopefully they'll get back to having that eighteen and nineteen advantage that they had those two years with the with the work that they put in. And you know the other thing is is that Stuart Reese comes over from Mississippi State. You got Delance. Those guys don't have any sort of continuity. Don't have any ability to practice during spring practice. They're sort of learning the continuity continuity throughout the year. And you know you lose a little bit of confidence. I think you could say this about the defense last year as well. Is when you're not sure the guy next to you is going to do his job it's a whole lot harder to concentrate on doing your own job. And I think there were probably plays last year on both sides of the ball for Florida where that was true. It's just that the um, transcendent playmakers on offense were able to cover up a lot of those mistakes that were made on the offensive side of the ball. And Florida didn't have any of those guys. There wasn't a defensive end with 14 sacks last year who could cover up when a defensive back didn't hold, um, didn't hold coverage long enough. And so, they don't have that this year. I think the point you made, Dave, about the floor being higher but the ceiling being lower um, is, is really a, a prescient one, which is that you know they're going to have to find where that ceiling is. I know, Neil, you mentioned in your article Malik Davis potentially moving out to receiver. That's great and all, but I, Malik Davis in the years that he's been at Florida hasn't shown that he has the kind of take-it-to-the-house ability that that you really want from a receiver and, and you know it's hard to replace Kadarius Tony but at the same time like if you can get a guy like Jamarcus Weston if you can get a guy like Xavier Henderson to show that kind of ability then it opens things up considerably so um you know we'll see I, I, again I think the extra runner by having the quarterback in the backfield being the guy who's doing a bulk of the running or at least the threat of the quarterback doing the bulk of the running is going to make the offensive line look way better just because it's a whole lot easier to block when you got an extra guy in there. Right. And when the defensive end can't crash and when the defensive end doesn't know where the quarterback's going to be, you know, you pin your ears back and pass rush Emory Jones, is just going to run right up the middle. 
So you're you're not going to be able to be as aggressive in the pass rush as they were last year when they knew where Kyle Trask was going to be. And so that makes it easier for your offensive lineman as well. I think it also – sorry, Dave. No, go ahead, no. I was just going to say, I think it also makes life easier in in playing and replacing Kyle Pitts because there's not a way to do that. Let's all be honest. Um, you know, generational talent, like I've said. But when you have that extra run in there, like if you run your like pop release plays, um, those are much more effective for a guy who's still a, a highly touted guy, like a Keymore Gamble, like a Keon Zipper, um, because they still have to account for that extra runner. They were never worried about that with Trask. The difference was – that Kyle Pitts was just so good and so difficult to cover that it did not matter. Um, and we saw that right in the SEC championship with, with Josh Job, like on his back. I mean, you know, and there are a couple how many, there were at least two plays where Josh Job, maybe one of the best corners in the country coming up this season is on Pitts and just shakes his head after the catch. Like what more can I do? Don't need as much of that when you have that extra runner. I think that makes life easier on those tight ends and, and to Will's point. So it's not just the five man in the line. It's basically everybody else. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, Will brought up Stuart Reese and look, I think when we look at what this offense will be in 2021, I think the best case scenario, it's a hybrid from what we saw Mullen late in his tenure at Mississippi state in his first year at Florida. And it's going to be a hybrid of Dak Prescott and Nick Fitzgerald and Felipe Franks. That's what it should be. I mean, that, that, if, if you believe in Emory Jones arm talent, it should be a hybrid of those offenses. And you know, at worst, it's going to be a Nick Fitzgerald looking offense at its best. It's going to be a Dak Prescott looking offense. I don't know. We get that. Dak Prescott's a special kind of quarterback. I think Emory Jones is better than Nick Fitzgerald. So I think, so well, I think we get something somewhere uh, in, in the middle of a hybrid offense uh, like that. And you guys brought him up. Uh, we'll go. We'll go to the last point. I'll bring up here uh, uh, for, from those article on the offensive side. Tied in year one, AKP after Kyle Pitts. I like that. I like that uh, acronym there, Neil. So you said it. You said it best. You're not replacing Kyle Pitts. You're not going to ask a tight end in this n- new hybrid offense that I'm going to go ahead and label, you know, a hybrid offense. You're not going to ask a tight end to do those things you asked Kyle Pitts to do. That's just what it is. You'll split that. Well, you know, Justin Shorter will be the passing threat that that the that the the Kyle Pitts was the, that that end of Kyle Pitts. He's not going to be Kyle Pitts. They'll probably ask him to do a lot of those same things. The blocking, the inline uh, tight end. There's your gamble. There's your zipper. That's what you know. You're going to split Kyle Pitts' roles. There's not going to be one guy who's going to do those roles like Kyle Pitts did. Those roles are now going to have to be split for 2021. Yeah, I think Keon is the best one. Um, yep. You know, without having seen anything in spring practice, like all of us, <laughs> um, you know, I think he's he's the most multiple, so to speak, uh, and versatile in what he can do. I like the shout for shorter doing some of that work. Honestly, I think anybody that can play through what did he have like a like a spleen injury or Trent Whittemore? I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean that kid is obviously tough, and you're talking about another year in – a year with Savage for him, um, you know, and so, and, and yet another guy we haven't brought up. So it's just, I hate to use like the cliche money ball thing, but it really will be, how do you replicate that production among multiple people? And it won't be the same, but at the same time, you've got other ways to stay on schedule this year that you didn't have with Kyle Trask under center, not a knock on Trask, just a different type of offense. Well, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's simple. You're not going to replace Kyle Pitts. You just gonna have, you're going to have to split those things up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I, I think the nice part is is that I I actually think it's a good thing that Kyle Trask didn't come back with all the weapons that are going to be missing because there would have been a there would have been a he would have gotten to start again, right? Because he he showed that he deserved it. But coming back would have meant that he would have had to deal with a completely different set of weapons, and those weapons don't really fit what 
he was trying to do. I think Neil's point's a great one, which is that because the offense is going to be different, what you're going to ask from the tight ends are going to be different, right? It's going to be much more important that you have a tight end who's able to block, who's able to hold that edge, who's able to make sure that essentially is an extension of the offensive line. You can put somebody out there. I think there will be plays where they actually bring out a sixth off- offensive lineman, and there's not really a tight end on the field, that they've got that offensive lineman out there just to sort of road grade. And then the big thing to me is going to be that they're going to have to be really efficient in the red zone. They, that once they get down there, they're going to have to make sure they convert into seven. They're probably, I would say that one of the things we should look for is how aggressive Mullen is on fourth down, because you're going to have to be aggressive on fourth down, because if you kick field goals, you know, last year you could kick a field goal and, and you know, the next time you get the ball, the next three times you're going to get the ball, you're going to end up with 21 points. It's not the way it's going to work in 2021. And so you're going to have to make those conversions. All right. Yep. So that'll do it there for the uh, offense and uh, the points there. As I mentioned, you guys want more of what Neil had to say for the offense. Go read his offensive side of the uh, article. As I said, posted that there uh, in the YouTube comments. And we'll move to the other side of the ball. And Neil, your first point, the line should be vastly improved. I agree. I mean, uh, I was jaded last year from the defense. You know, I thought this defense was going to be very athletic and one of Todd Grantham's best, uh, you know, maybe, a lot, maybe too many places where guys didn't fit. Um, maybe some re- relaxation. I think you could probably say, you know, uh, Marco Wilson didn't necessarily get, not, not necessarily getting pushed uh, early on uh, in, in camp in, in the season led to him getting uh, more play in time. And, you know, we, we saw how all that turned out. Uh, there, I think, you know, probably more on the defensive side of the ball is where the younger guys just didn't necessarily get their chance. I don't think the coaching staff, without fall camp, without spring camp, just didn't trust uh, the, the young guys. They get that this year. I expect to see the, the youth movement we wanted to see at times during the season last year. It's going to rear its head, uh, I think, this year. But for the defensive line, it starts with those two transfers. Florida needed transfers. They had to go get them. They get guys who have a lot of experience coming in playing that defensive tackle role. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was, that was priority A. Um, you know, I mean, who'd have thought that they – maybe Will, one, one of the smartest people that writes about the team, but uh, who would have thought that, that they would miss Adam Schuler that much, right? Um, and, and they did. Uh, I thought – and I didn't want to be as harsh as I think I was a little, maybe a little too harsh on the defensive tackles in the piece. Um, but they asked a lot of Gervin Dexter and he wasn't quite ready to do it. Kyrie Campbell missed games early in the season. And it was, I thought it was really night and day. A and Neil, and to your point, what true freshman defensive tackles are in the SEC? Sure. Uh, yeah. It's a, you know, and, and that's exactly, it's not a knock on Gervin who yeah. is going to have a tremendous career. I think it's just uh that's a that's a tough ask, and especially early in the year when Kyrie was was out, uh, it was even harder. I, everybody just doubled TJ Slayton, um, and you know I think he's a talented kid, but not talented enough to kind of deal with the double teams. Um, and I thought that that created all sorts of problems at the second level as well, which I touch on uh, in the piece. To me, they went out and did the right thing. I, you know, I'm really high on uh, Shelton, the kid from Penn State. If you play 40 games um, in the Big Ten for a really good program, um, you are probably a pretty good football player. And then I went and watched a lot of film on uh, of Shelton, just terrific as a run stopper, um, a guy that's going to get leverage uh, and do some things that Florida has not been able to do at the tackle position. I think that fans that expect Daquan Newkirk to be revela- uh, a sort of a revelation are going to be disappointed, but as a solid depth piece, uh, and a guy that's played 30 football games in the SEC, I think he adds bulk and just gives them a nice rotation at tackle um, that they haven't really had. So, um, plus there's the the whole issue of having a, of having a whole s- summer with Savage, and then guys that we haven't that I haven't mentioned like Jalen Lee and and you know who knows maybe Desmond Watson too. So, uh, just a big group. At tackle, and I think that's one of these rising tides uh, lifts all boats things. Like if Florida gets better tackle play, it's just so much of SEC football. It starts inside. Yeah, I know that was uh, one of Will's biggest. 
first points when he came on Gators Breakdown was uh, looking at the, how how important defensive tackles are in, in the SEC. And it really does start there uh, on the defense. You look at all the great Florida defenses, and you could probably say that they start there in the middle uh, on the defensive line, the defensive tackle. Man, I, I think, Neil, kind of going to your point and I'll extend it here. Yeah, I really think this – these transfers, I think, you know, really help the – potential of somebody like Gervin Dexter, you know, if they didn't get, if they only got one of these transfers or, you know, God forbid, none of them, Dexter's going to be out there playing way too many snaps. And by the time third, fourth quarter rolls around, you can forget about, you know, <laughs> any type of uh, production uh, you get from a big time five star like that. So we'll go on. I think this helps Gervin Dexter live up to his potential. You're not going to go out there and ask him to play so many downs. He's going to be out, he's going to be able to go out there, play fresh. As Neil's point, you know, for, for depth. More importantly, now getting these transfers for for depth purposes, I think it helps a young rising star like Dexter reach his full potential. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that Gervin Dexter is going to be the key to whether Todd Grantham survives next year. Because mm. if you think about it, you've got Newkirk essentially kind of replacing Slayton. You've got, I think, Shelton or Valentini. He's going by Valentini now, replacing Campbell. And then you got Dexter is sort of in the Dexter role from last year. And if Dexter can be a real game changer inside, then, you know, Neil made a great point in this article, which is that last year Florida's linebackers were getting mauled because the defensive line wasn't able to hold up. And those pulling tackles or pulling guards coming around were just drilling the linebackers. The linebackers weren't big enough to be able to deal with it and weren't able to take them on in the hole. And even if you do take them on in the hole, you're still at a disadvantage at that point. So, you know, the guys like Watson, guys like Lee, completely unproven. But last year, what they had to do, especially when Campbell was gone, was they had to slide Zach Carter inside, which then meant they put uh, Brenton Cox at defensive end. And then they had Jeremiah Moon playing the buck. And that's not necessarily the best use of Cox's talent or Moon's talent. Um, they eventually brought in Bogle and sort of had Bogle and Cox then on the outside. But still, you were light on the inside with Carter and, and Dexter. If you had Carter and Dexter in there, you were really light. And, and then once Campbell came back, things started to settle down a little bit, but still not really elite play. My, my big concern here is depth, right? I mean, you get one injury, like you said, Dave. Thankfully, we got the two transfers. But if one of those guys goes down with an injury early in the year, you're you're back to a part you're back to a place where Dexter's playing too many plays, where you really have to have either Desmond Watson or Jalen Lee step up and be an integral part of what's going on, or you're gonna have to slide Zach Carter back inside. Now, thankfully, Todd Grantham has recruited about 45 bucks. And so there should be people to put on the outside, but the, those guys are a extraordinary key to being able to have a defense that's able to really step up and play better than it did last year. And I don't think you can underestimate it. And, you know, it's really the place that I look at and say, I'm most concerned about 2021 Newkirk and, and Valentini have a lot of, have a lot of experience Dexter got his experience last year, but we, we haven't seen him step up and be an elite guy yet. And if they have to slide Carter back inside, it's going to be another long year for those linebackers. Speaking of linebackers, that's where we'll go next. And, Neil, to your point, you said the key to better linebacker play is better defensive line play. There we go, <laughs> kind of kind of echoing that sentiment there. Um, and you're kind of pairing that with what you said, you know, Diabate and Hopper appear ready to break out. And that goes to back to, to Scott, our Gators Breakdown Plus member. Uh, he sent this in, too. You know, will Hopper and Diabate be the starting linebackers or will Miller hold on to a starting spot? The coaching staff loves Miller, so uh, that uh, there's there's no doubt in my mind he's as long as he's healthy uh, and, and recovers from the uh, injury he had in the spring, he'll be the starting. If you want to say middle linebacker, you know it, if that's what you want to call it. Florida plays a lot of two linebackers, so ain't really such thing as a middle linebacker. Uh, but uh, if you want to call it a strong linebacker, I guess we'll call it that for for Ventro Miller. Uh, but he, yeah, he's going to be one of the starting two linebackers, you know, unless we get in the fall camp and 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 Hopper and Wingo and you know Diabate are just that head and shoulders above. But I know how much the coaching staff loves Miller, much playing times he got last year. He's going to be, you know, even if he, he's going to be starting, but he's going to get a whole lot of playing time regardless if you want to label him a starter or however many linebackers Florida has on the field. Yeah, I think the starters are going to be Miller and Diabate. Um, and I, I think that for what you just said about Miller, it's not quite as, as torrid a love affair with Diabate, but it's close. Um, and I think it's, it's, you know, if they have a Diabate criticism, it's probably that 
he does last year, at least he got lost inside a little bit. Um, and some of that I think was tackle play. Uh, and he struggled because he was getting mauled at the second level and wasn't physical enough to kind of fit gaps. Um, and let's he's not forget, added, learning on the job at the same time. Of course. And I, you know, he's, he's added 15 pounds. Um, so the two guys that I, when I talked to a staffer for the defensive side of the piece, which is why it ran second actually. Um, so the two guys that the coaching staff mentioned uh, in particular were Diabate and Jalen Lee as the guys they thought super competitive, really benefiting from, from strength and conditioning. Uh, you know, one guy said, you forget that, that Jalen Lee is a blue chip kid because, you know, we've, we've raised the talent quotient was kind of <laughs> the <laughs> attitude that I got. And, and I said, well, you know, I'm sure that the Gator nation will be thrilled to hear that, that Jalen can contribute. And it's not just the Gervin Dexter show. Um, but, but I think with the Abate, he's going to play and do, do the 15 pounds. I mean, he's a little bit better uh, in the, in the run game. He certainly has that element, that Voshan Joseph element where he's so fast. And, you know, I think he can be an integral part of that exotic blitzing scheme. He has been really since the middle of his freshman year, the guy that intrigues me the most is Hopper. Um, mm-hmm. A top five, a top five linebacker in the country, um, out of high school, outside linebacker, uh, and probably I thought if you watch film, probably Florida's best coverage linebacker. Uh, limited numbers of snaps, but you know, really, really and, good in co- in coverage. And that's what Florida needs. Florida needs the most improvement from the linebacker position to cover, and that, that could be where a lot of the criticism from Miller comes from. Uh, you know, in coverage, but to me, you shouldn't be asking him to to cover a whole lot. And you, you to me, you got to set your defense up for that. Um, now, offenses can dictate that, go up tempo, keep a lot of four receivers on the field, and and uh, you know, get get your defense in precarious situations. But and that's the name of the game right now. But uh, going 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 to Hopper, I mean, asking around, Neil, he may have been the MVP of the spring. Of all spring, Hopper may have been if 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 when the handout awards coming out of spring ball, Tyron Hopper may have been the MVP of the whole team. Yeah, it took him a little while to find his footing. I mean, that happens. I mean, that was a really highly touted linebacker class, right? Um, and you know, all those guys were were blue chip dudes, and we thought all of them would contribute. And Hopper took a little longer than Diabate because Hopper didn't really carve out a role on special teams like Diabate did, uh, but. I think he's Florida's best coverage linebacker and, and has a chance to maybe be the best one they've had in a while, uh, which I think is, is just immense because the other thing that um, should be better and should make some of Florida's linebacker coverage issues, you know, look a little less bad, so to speak, is the fact that the safety play should probably be better. Uh, there's nowhere to go, but up. Um, but but yeah, I mean, the idea of having a guy like Hopper on the field is is encouraging when it's third and ten, and and uh, everyone that has a video can just throw the ball to their tight end and watch him work a Florida linebacker, right? Yeah, Will, man, the, the, the biggest thing is in going to Neil's point is okay, you can't have guys who are power. And that's all they have. Or you can't have guys who are just speed, and that's all they have. You know, Florida's got to find guys that can just be in on on most plays on defense. And that that may be the biggest issue at linebacker. Well, I mean, that's that was the hope with Hopper and Wingo, right? That you get right. these guys who are high level recruits who are able to be three down linebackers. Um, you know, you talk about three down running backs, guys who can catch out of the field, guys who can pass protect, guys who can run the ball. <coughs> Excuse me. It's the same thing at running back, or same thing at linebacker, where you need guys who who are equivalent when it comes to the run game and in the passing game. But you know, guys like Dylan Moses, guys like Dante Hightower, those guys don't come along all the time. And so, the reality is, if you look at what Florida's defense did in 2018 and 2019, you know, David Reese got pulled out in games when that when and in situations where there were opportunities for the defense to throw the ball and they brought in guys to who were a little bit better in coverage. I, I know he got torched in the Tennessee game in 2018. And that was when they started running guys in and out on third down when when you could take advantage of of the linebacker. And last year they didn't have anybody to run out there, right? So I I think I expect to see Ventrell Miller be sort of the 
the against the run linebacker when they need a little bit more bulk. And then you get a guy like Hopper who comes in and Diabate maybe slides inside. And then you've got those guys when you need more coverage and you need more speed, you're going to bring more exotic blitzes. But that's kind of what Florida has to do because they have not been able to find a three down linebacker, just like they, you know, that, and it is interesting that we're talking about the defensive line needs to improve, the linebackers need to improve. And when we get to the secondary, it's going to be the same message. So <laughs> that tells you something about how big a disaster last year was. But uh, yeah, I mean, I expect to see those guys in in coverage situations. I think they're going to get, I think they're going to have packages, kind of like you think of packages for Emory Jones when he comes in a quarterback. They're going to be linebacker packages where you're putting them out there and asking them to do very specific things. But last year on third down, there were multiple times in that Alabama game where Ventrell Miller got matched up with Najee Harris. And I suspect that Florida is going to have a better answer for that in 2021. Well, yeah, quickly, but just to kind of jokingly go to Will's point there and say, hey, you got to improve at this level, this level, and this level. <laughs> but you look at but you look at the rosters and you start naming the top players on the team, and as bad as the defense is, you're starting on defense when you start naming off the best players on the team, at least in a proven aspect. Kyrie Elon's probably if you if you list them, Kyrie Elon's probably the best player on the team. I think everybody would probably start there. Zach Carter, number two. Is that where you would start going going there? So I'm saying it's kind of weird saying because of you lost Trask, you lost Tony, you lost Pitts. As bad as the defense is, you're still starting. If you're ranking Florida player from one to a hundred, you're starting with two defensive guys. Well, that <laughs> that's uh, you know, Dave, that's funny. I mean, like last year when we were taking inventory of, hey man, what the heck just happened? Um, one well, of the part things- of it is I don't think we believe the defense was that. They shouldn't have been that bad last year. Were they that, well, that bad? Yes. They shouldn't have been that bad. A hundred percent. And that's the point. When we were when we were taking inventory of what happened, and we we all have talked. You know, I'm a long time Gator Spread Down listener, so when I come on, I'm like, man, I know what you guys have been talking about, and <laughs> and uh, you know, the blue chips from where did this program elevate the roster? You know, they built depth defensively in terms of your numbers of, of four-star guys. There were more of them. And if you looked at the talent composite, there was more talent on the defensive side of the football than on the offensive side of the football, even though you had these generational playmakers that kind of made you forget that if you just looked at star ratings. So um, now the thing was that those guys were, were all a lot, not all, but a lot of them were very, very young. And your upperclassmen were not, as highly touted, they were not, you know, I don't, and I don't want to get into just pure stars matter, but I think some of it is, you know, we were waiting. I think a lot of us underestimated the youth factor, which got compounded by the lack of spring ball uh, and kind of that urgency of fall camp where you're playing this SEC only schedule, um, you know, and it's not an excuse for the fact that all three levels really failed uh at all but i think it's it's interesting because you're right i would go as far to say that the you know and i know i had the hot take in the piece but i think maybe your three best football players are on defense depending on how you view tradings finish to the season i mean i don't think it's uh, i don't think it's blasphemy <laughs> to, to say that I mean, and, maybe I, and maybe that's a scary thing i don't know I don't know. I, I'm going to bring Malik Davis in there uh-huh. as as somebody who's proven himself at least in two separate years, right? Under the McIlwain regime, he was really good as a running back his true freshman year. And then when we got to last year, obviously, he was really good coming out of the backfield. Um, I think Emory Jones, in some respects, has proven himself more than some of the guys on the defensive side of the ball. Um, Trey Dean got put in a situation, in a couple of situations, where he was really sort of taken away from what he was recruited for, what he was comfortable with, and and was willing to do that sort of thing. So I do think we need to give him some props. At the same time, um, you know, the reality is is that if Dean is if Dean's somebody that we're relying on this year to really lock things down, I think that's um, okay, but I don't think that's necessarily great. There, there isn't anything that I have seen thus far that says this guy's going to be a lockdown safety, but he can be a good SEC safety. And I think if you can sort of, it, it's the same thing Neil said about tight end, right? If you can start to sort of 
piece those different pieces on defense together. If Kyrie Elam can lock down one side and then you get Jason Marshall on the other side coming as a true freshman, if he can lock down that side, one, it makes the safety's jobs a little bit easier. But then again, if the defensive line plays a little bit better, then the linebackers are a little bit freer in coverage and that sort of sets things up. And, and so it really is sort of a symbiotic relationship. It's why I harp so much on defensive tackles because it makes such a big difference. But, you know, to your point, Neil, some of some of the stuff that we we overlooked or or at least dismissed, I think, is some of the attrition, right? I mean, last year, if instead of having Marco Wilson out there, or instead of having Marco Wilson as the as the second corner, if you had Chris Steele out there who played really well at USC, I mean, that's an opportunity to potentially get better um, from from a Florida perspective, right? Just to have two corners out there who can be locked down. Last year they didn't have that. So the other thing is I think when you go back and look at the film. It, it, there was a lot of trust issues. It's, you know, the defensive line would do its job. The linebackers wouldn't. The linebackers would do their job. The defensive line wouldn't. The corners would do their job. The safeties wouldn't. The safeties would do their job. The corners wouldn't. And that was just sort of a perpetual thing. In they, Florida couldn't run three or four straight plays on defense without having somebody step out of line and not do their job. And in some cases, that's because you're trying to cover for somebody else when you don't trust that they're going to do theirs. And and hopefully the spring practice is going to is going to at least reinforce, you do your job and then we'll deal with it if the other person doesn't do theirs. Um, and, that, and that maybe is the thing that I hope we see in 2021 is that the coaching staff does actually – make there be consequences when you don't do your job on the defensive side of the ball. That That's going to be the biggest thing. And I think that's what we all wanted to see. We didn't get a chance to see uh, last year. Now I want you to extend on it. Uh, you know, We'll hit on it a little bit, but this is how you pointed it out in your article. The trading story should be your favorite Florida football story in 2021. Uh, I do want people to go read that, but uh, you know, briefly tell us why that uh, th- th- that should be the case. Whether you blame coaches or you blame trading's insistence that he was a corner, uh, there were issues with Trey's performance on the football field in his two years, in in a couple years, uh, that drew the ire of fans. And I think rightly so, some kind of high-profile plays in losses in particular where – he looked lost. Um, and then the move to star was an unequivocal disaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, and whether you think, Hey, that was what the staff made him do, or that was Trey, you know, like I said, I don't think any of that matters. What I think is what makes him such a great story to me is that it is widely reported that he humbled himself, that he sat down and said, you know, this isn't working. I want to be at Florida. He could have transferred. Um, You know, it's important to my family. I get my degree from Florida. Uh, How can I help the team? Well, Trey, you can help the team by moving back to safety where you were a high four-star recruit. Okay. Um, And then second half of the season, how many times did Dave or Will or Nick De La Torre or anybody tweet very quietly, Trey Dean is having a terrific football (laughs) Um, or or – you know, did someone suggest why is trading not in the football game? Yeah. Uh, which, which I think gets to some of Will's points. Um, and had one of the biggest plays of the season against Alabama, of course, you know, fumbles uh, after gets that miraculous interception <laughs> against Mac Jones. But I mean, a heck of a play there, but you know, beside, before he gets, you know, blindside yeah. hit and sure, before he gets targeted, um, yeah. you know, a great, <laughs> a great little play. Uh, don't get the flag. You know, who knows? Who knows what happens if they if they throw a targeting penalty on Mechie? It's a great play by Mechie, by the way. Um, I think people are like, that was targeting, and it's kind of like, well, you know, uh, it's still a really good play. What else is he going to do? Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, so I think it's just a tremendous story about a kid that, that, that was humbled um, and that has done precisely what the coaching staff asked him to do uh, and now has a chance to – to shine as a senior and he has a lot of tools, um, you know, from a physical and athletic standpoint. So I think he's going to have a terrific season. And I think I always love, you know, these redemption stories are all too rare now in the era of the portal because kids just leave. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that that happens a lot. Uh, I'll go and throw here, uh, you know, super chat here. Uh, Lamar Stevens, I'll throw him a shout out here. Uh, it says, what Will said about the trust issues on defense was the theme of 2020 football. People said offensive numbers were up because it was an all SEC schedule. No defenses were robbed of their chemistry. And I mean, <laughs> you know, it's um, a lot of us didn't want to say, all right. You know, when we looked at the defensive issues, it was, well, every team's dealing with it. That's true to a point. I, I I think every team was dealing with it, but I think the way you know, if we're always going to give this Florida staff a whole lot of credit for the development and how they teach the game of football, they lost that. So did everybody deal with it? Absolutely, but maybe it hit Florida harder because of the reputation of being able to develop the the the, the ability to teach that they lost, and they lost you know what a, a spring and a fall camp to do that. I mean, here's the reality. Alabama was awful against Ole Miss early in the season. (laughs) Alabama was a heck of a lot better later in the season. And granted, we're talking about Alabama, but you know, I think that was the theme for a lot of different teams that very early in the year sort of, um, you know, sort of were able to progress. Now, one thing I think is difficult to to monitor, and is something you know, there were some stories recently for the Boston Celtics where Jason Tatum had COVID early in the year. His his stats took a dip, and now he's using an inhaler before games apparently to sort of open up his lungs. And as somebody who had this stuff last month, I can tell you, it, it really does impact you. And so I, I don't know that we're ever really going to know what the impact of COVID going through the program after the A and M game had on those guys, their ability to develop, their ability to get better. There might just be some guys who are really struggling with some of the after effects of the disease. Again, that's, I don't know, but, but it's something that sort of came to mind when I saw that story from Tatum, but the elephant in the room here is Grantham, right? I mean, the, the reality is, is that we can talk about players and what they need to do and how they need to step up and all that sort of stuff. But Trey Dean was the best guy at safety. He didn't play until the second half of the year because it just became untenable to have some of the guys who were back there. You know, you got the through sh- the shoe throwing incident, and Marco stays on the field. Um, you know, I- I'm not somebody who's going to sit here and say he never should have played again or 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 anything like that. But you got to take the guy off the field after a stupid penalty like that. You just have to. And without any sort of consequences to any screw ups, I mean, you know, we we had a guy reach out to us, Dave, after the A and M game. Basically, it was something like out of all the possible yards A&M could have gotten, they were like 60 yards short. So basically, he was saying that every time they got the ball, they went the entire field and scored, except for once. I think it was the fumble that Stewart caused on a little slant route. It was going to be a first down, (laughs) and Stewart caused the fumble on the slant route. Florida recovers it. You thought at that point Florida was going to put the game away, but... You know the defense just didn't stop anybody, and his point was you can put you could put me out there at at defensive back, and you would still be you would still be okay. So the fact that there wasn't any accountability, the fact that the team didn't get better throughout the year, um, all those things come back to Grantham, and that to me is where the trepidation lies when it comes to defense. I think you, there's a scenario where all of these things come together, but that scenario relies on the defensive coordinator putting people in a position to succeed. And we didn't see that last year. We did see it the year before and the year before that, but let's be honest. A lot of those guys weren't his players. Those were people who had been here, had already developed. And then he sort of taught them the scheme versus guys he's recruited. And that's who he's dealing with this year. And Neil, I know you want to get in here and think about that. This is coming from, you know, people more so me than, than will, I defended Grantham 2018, 2019 when there was a lot of loud fans, you know, so it, it takes a lot for me to admit it was a colossal failure and I wouldn't even go on after 2020. You know, I was, I wasn't, I won't say all aboard the Grantham train and I, th- I did think the 2020 defense was going to be a whole lot better, but I, it's just hard to justify what we saw last year. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's, that teased me up. So I appreciate that, Dave. Um, look, and I actually had more of it in the in the piece that my they made an editorial change um, to, shorten, <laughs> to shorten what I was saying. But only Alabama has had a top twenty defense as many times as Florida. They're tied um, this century uh, at sixteen. Um, and if you go back all the way to nineteen eighty four, um, which is how far I went back, and I did not pick that arbitrarily. I picked it because you know sec champs and all but uh florida has been a really terrific defensive program for 40 years and the numbers last year were historically bad 
And the only defenses that were comparable were defenses that were either less talented um, in the late 80s and early 90s, or the coordinator was fired after the season, um, Bob Pruitt, right? Uh, and that team still went 12-0 because they had generational offensive talent. Um, and then the 2007 defense, which is the one that you put the little asterisk by, but that team's defensive coordinator was Charlie Strong. <laughs> <laughs> and this one's is Todd Grantham. So, uh, you know, Florida, from a defensive standpoint, not quite as talented as that 2007 group, but certainly – a lot of talent on the side of the ball. No excuse for being 83rd in total defense. No excuse for being 82nd in yards allowed per play. And you can say, oh, some of that's skewed by the Oklahoma game. Sure. Uh, but still 70. <laughs> yeah. in scoring. It, it just followed a trend from the rest of the season. So are we, are sure. we really sure it was sure. an outlier? <laughs> uh, I figured we. I figured our stats probably got better after the Oklahoma game, to be honest with you. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you compare it to the half a hundred that Alabama scored um, – you know, so, so, I, I, I have a question for you, Neil. What does Grantham need to do to win back the Gator fan base? I mean, because I, I've, I've sort of been racking my brain in terms of a stat to look at or or something where, you know, he can bring them back onto his side. I, I, I am um, I'm a little bit at a loss for words when it comes to that, which is unusual for me. But I'm just wondering from your perspective, like, what do you think needs to happen on defense for um for, for Florida fans to get jazzed up about Grantham as their coordinator. So uh, you're, you're teasing a piece I've got coming up at Saturday down South. Um, and it, the impetus for this piece is that sometimes on SEC network or ESPN classic, they'll show these old games. And one game that was on a few weeks ago was Alabama miss state uh, in Starkville. And it was a Jalen Hurts game. It was basically Jalen Hurts just won the game in the fourth quarter because Todd Grantham, for whatever reason, decided that he needed to zero blitz a running quarterback who was having trouble completing passes uh, late in the fourth quarter. And Mullen had just schemed that game beautifully, given who his quarterback was and everything. And and Miss State should have won the game. Uh, I think he has to beat Alabama. And I think it's got to be like 24 to 20 and Florida wins because they do what Todd Grantham sometimes actually does do and freak out a young quarterback on the road and, and solve that riddle. I think that's one, that's option a, you know, option two is maybe they make, maybe they have a great fourth quarter and and they win the Georgia game again. Um, But I think he's got a glorious opportunity in the swamp in September and history past his prologue in college football, right? Like history is a guide. And if you're going to beat Nick Saban, you better do it in September. So, uh, you know, it's an opportunity for Florida. I really don't think there's another scenario where he wins them back because th- there's just not enough. Um, you know, there's too many people that just wanted him gone. It's the same. I don't think it, it's as fair to Mike and you all will never be surprised to hear me say that, but it's very similar to the, can Mike White win the the Florida basketball fans back? Like, I don't think so. I don't know how fair that is to Mike um, vis-a-vis Grantham, but I think they're both in kind of a similar boat. Like, Mike would have to, like, hang banners. And for Grantham, it, you know, what's the equivalent of hanging a banner? Well, how about ending a colossal losing streak to Alabama because of your defense? And look, part of it comes – look how good the offense was last year. Most fans think, you know – because the defense was so bad, it threw away every opportunity Florida had. You know, you wasted a year because of one side of the football. You know, if the offense had just been average and the defense looked like that, I won't say it was more forgivable, but I don't think uh, all the I don't think all the ire would be just just thrown on Grantham. But after twenty twenty, it's mostly you know everything that happened on the field is because Grantham couldn't get it done and the the defense basically failed the team uh, for the season. So I think that's part of it too. It, it, it got, it got put to negative 100 because you had this offense and you wasted the season because of the defense. 
I'm, I'm about to start calling him fourth in Grantham because last year the, the Gators were 71st in third down conversion percentage allowed at 41%, but they were 97th in fourth down conversion percentage allowed. They allowed 65% of their fourth downs against to be converted. So he he is he is officially jettisoned the third in Grantham nickname, at least in my house. It's now fourth in Grantham, which oh, I think on. says something about there being a lot of fourth and ones and yeah. fourth and twos. And so hopefully having those defensive tackles, like we talked about earlier, being able to actually put the offenses against, you know, up against the sticks is going to prevent that. But 65.2% fourth down conversions against last year. That is awful. Well, what about best saying is it doesn't have to be either or it can be both. So it's third, <laughs> it's third and fourth Grantham. That, that's, that's what we're going with. Third and fourth Grantham. Oh uh, no. <laughs> uh, all right, guys, quickly, last point before we, uh, before we wrap up here, um, Colin sent one more Gators Breakdown Plus. Uh, he says you know, on defense, and this is something not brought up a whole lot still, the one black, number one JUCO prospect. Everything looks on track for him to be uh, coming into the Gators program this summer, this fall. It's taking the long road to become a Gator. Uh, where do you see him slotting, in, slotting into the 2021 team? That kind of goes to the linebacker discussion we had a little bit too, but I'm thinking star. Uh, I think what we wanted Amari Bernie to be after 2018 is what we're going to get for DeWan Black. Almost same size, almost same stature. I think a little thicker, but more athletic, more versatile, I think, is what we get Diabate. Bernie may have that straight line speed, but for as far as you know, as far as DeWan Black goes, he's going to be one of the most athletic players Florida has on their whole entire roster, not just on defense, offense and defense, special teams, however you want to label you know this Florida team and, and where he fits into the into the hierarchy. The one black is going to be one of the most athletic guys when he steps on the field. Yeah, I mean look, he's one of those cool get off the bus guys. Yeah. <laughs> Florida Florida hasn't had as many of them as they should have and and we've all we've talked about that to death, you know, certainly since the McElwain era. But like when you see the first time you see the one black on the field you know, he's going to give you that that vibe that you got from like Dante Fowler or Carlos Dunlap or this is one of those guys that you see him in pads and you go, look at that dude. Um, and he's, yeah, I mean, he's just really instinctual football player. So I think the star and just a guy that uh, has such a great nose for the ball. I- I'm excited. I'm excited to see him play. I mean, I'm excited to see him play, too. It's a great story, right? I mean, you mentioned earlier, Neil, about Trey Dean being a story everybody's rooting for. But I think uh, I think the one black is a story that anybody who knows that story is is rooting for as well. Um, but it's one of those things where you just don't know what to expect, right, mm-hmm. Dave? I mean, I, I hope. I mean, heck, if you told me that at the end of the year, the one black would be a major difference maker on special teams, I'd say, awesome, that's a great year. If you told me that he was playing, playing a lot of linebacker, I'd be like, that's probably not a good sign because there are guys who have more experience and just as much talent in front of him. Now, maybe he comes in and, and just flashes, you know, the point Neil's making about the way he looks in pads is a point we've made about sort of the value of the spring game um, is that when you're watching the spring game and you see guys flash, that's one of the things that you're sort of looking for um, because you're not really looking at scheme and you're not really looking at how guys, um, you know, you're not looking at stats when it comes to that sort of thing. What you're really looking for is, does that guy have a skill set that differentiates him from someplace else? So that's maybe what you're looking for with Black. But it's, I mean, you know, the talent in high school, the talent in junior college is different than the talent in the SEC. The question is going to be, does he flash when he's playing against guys in the SEC? And we just haven't seen that yet. Yeah, we're definitely ready for it and ready to see him. I know he's a player we've been looking for. Two two years now <laughs> to get on campus and, and see, and mostly because of the story, and everybody's been following that story of wanting to come to Florida, needing to be with, wanting to be with Dan Mullen, moved to Florida to try and get into Florida a little easier, had to end up going the JUCO route, and maybe it pays off uh, for the one black. So, Neil, man, like I said, everybody go out there. Uh, I got the links right there in the YouTube. Go read uh, Neil's articles there for even more discussion on what we uh, discussed for this past hour. Uh, Neil, you even teased what you have coming up. But one more time, I want any more uh, work coming at you, uh, coming from you uh, at Saturday Down South. Yeah, so I have two fun pieces coming. Um, well, one of them is fun and one of them is less fun. Uh, so the Grantham piece I teased, uh, can Todd Grantham win back Florida fans? Is, is the, the working title of the article? So it's hilarious that that was uh, a question that was brought up tonight. Because I'm that doesn't even need to be the working title. I think you can just run with that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I need to change it anymore. Um, 
And then the other piece, we they've been running a series at Saturday Down South. We've been running a series on the, the top true freshmen uh, at each program in the last however many number of years. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a go at that uh, with the Gators uh, in the, in the last several years. And, and, you know, how far is that, how far is that going back? So uh, you could go back to 2010, but most everybody started at 2015. Okay. And what I've got to say about that real quick is uh, it's amazing how few true freshmen really make a huge impact. Antonio you know, Callaway. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I mean, it's, the list isn't long. No. Huh. Oh, yeah. That'd be an interesting piece. Uh, that definitely, definitely check that one out. Will, man, anything for you before we sign off here? Yeah. So I, I'm planning, I probably won't be able to get it done tonight, but I'm planning on uh, having a piece on Jordan Reed. He just retired nice. from the NFL um, because of concussions. And so, um, you know, he was a big part of sort of the, the end of the Urban Meyer era, the beginning of the, of the Muschamp era. Um, converting from a quarterback to a tight end and then becoming a successful tight end there in the NFL. So, um, you know, I think he's somebody who probably gets overlooked because of the transition. But, you know, when you, when you talk about Florida tight ends, I mean, Kyle Pitts is definitely better. But when you talk about guys like Troop and you talk about some of the other guys who've played and been effective at tight end, I think Jordan Reed probably gets overlooked. But uh, I was going to write a little bit about what he what he brought to the Florida program and then his, and then his career overall. I really like Jeff seeing him off on my fantasy team plenty of times. And – uh I hated, hated for him that he got injured. I hated it for my fantasy team every year he got, he got injured. Uh, but man, he was he was so fun to watch. I know a lot of people just remember. I saw it, you know, today a lot uh, the Georgia game and, and the fumble at the end of the 2012 game. But you know, for him to go on and have a great career in the NFL uh, for as long as he was on the field. Uh, and I, I did tweet that today. Is that I do wonder what n- kind of numbers he would have put up if he would have been on the field, you know, 16 games a year. He was he was a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, it wasn't the shoe throw, but that one was a pretty scarring fumble there against <sighs> Georgia. But it, but it was also sort of indicative of the entire Must Champ era, which is we're almost there, but no. <laughs> and, that, and that sort of is the the uh, the overarching theme of Must Champ's career. So uh, bigger and better things these days. But certainly, best of luck to Jordan Reed as he as he adjusts to retirement. Hopefully, the concussions he suffered don't end up causing him long term harm. And, uh, and hopefully we'll see him back in Gainesville where he can help participate and, and uh, you know, maybe be a bigger part of the Florida program. Now he's got more free time. Yeah. It'd be fun to see him there, see him down in the swamp. So, all right, that'll do it for this episode of Gators Breakdown. Neil Blackman, you can find him at Saturday Down South and at NW Blackman on Twitter. Will Miles, you can find him at Read and Reaction and at Will Miles SEC on Twitter. I'm the host of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at Gator Dave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.